The week between Christmas and New Year's is filled with one of two things, I think. Those annual reviews of the year gone by and movie marathons. We've been engaged in both of those activities in my household this week. We're currently watching all of the Star Wars, I used to say trilogy, but it's not a trilogy. It's a trilogy of trilogies and all kinds of other spin-offs. And of course, Star Wars seems like an appropriate star-based theme for this epiphany season. However, it's a sad reality that when given more time off from work, what do we do but rush to fill our additional time with screen time? And to keep up with this appetite, streaming services and production companies crank out numerous new selections around the holidays. The one movie that caught Willow and my imagination and attention this week was the Netflix movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence called Don't Look Up. The plot starts out rather conventional, featuring an end-of-the-world cataclysmic event and a newly discovered comet on a direct collision path with the planet Earth. And it will destroy it completely unless we destroy the comet first. Scientists DiCaprio and Lawrence have the duty of sharing this bad news with the world. And this is where the film gets interesting and original because it's really a diagnostic farce about the absurdity of our current cultural moment. As the film suggests, no one wants to look up and acknowledge the reality of the situation. Instead, people are interested in entertaining themselves to death, engaged with the newest breakup and re-engagement of a couple, a singing couple, and it, or engaged in political infighting. In fact, Don't Look Up actually becomes a campaign rallying slogan of a calculating, calculating president, played by a very insidious Meryl Streep, who's facing bad polling numbers. After hearing the chance of collision is 99.8%, she pauses, looks incredulously, and says, well, let's call it 70%, and then let's move on. You can't go around saying to people there's a 100% chance they're going to die. That's just nuts. <laughs> oh, the irony. I think the chance is that we're all going to die at some point. It's only after the mission to destroy the comet is aborted mid-course after a lobbying effort by a phone company in favor of a plan to carefully break apart the comet so that it might outmaneuver Chinese interests and to harbor all those precious minerals in the comet and bring them back safely to Earth, we realize just how fraught our current moment is. For it is obvious that the film is commenting on our present moment and our inability to come together to solve real life and real death problems. I'd be lying if I didn't say that this cultural diagnosis didn't play a role in my thinking about today's reading about a different celestial body, the Magi star, of course. And of course, this is a mysterious and odd story that has sparked imagination for generations in the church. It's a story of mysterious astronomers from faraway lands back east that are searching the night sky until they discover a sign. And yet this isn't the Christmas story most of us share with our kids and grandkids in our lives. It's not even the Christmas story we tell at Easter, except, of course, the slight inclusion of those three nice saintly figures. We strip out all of the other political intrigue and consequences, retaining only those three wise men and their precious gifts. Truth be told, it's not the Christmas story we like to remember, especially that part about a paranoid Herod slaughtering all those innocent children. Here are the troubling elements most briefly. An easily threatened and manipulative despot who turns to violence when thwarted, traveling and well-intentioned astrologers and seekers, first duped but then enlightened into resistance, a family on the run for their lives, given sanctuary in a foreign land. And when the slaughter of the innocents omitted by this lection is the, the, then the slaughter of the innocents, which is omitted by the lectionary, necessarily perhaps, but I think it needs to at least be mentioned if we don't read the whole story. Having named even this much, though, it's hard not to admit that while this might not be the Christmas story we want to hear, it's a version of the Christmas story that resonates deeply and troublingly with our own times. It's not an exact corollary, we should be clear, and trying to transform it into an allegory by substituting our least favorite political leaders for Herod 
doesn't finally do the biblical story any justice. But it's difficult to miss the resonance. We, too, have too many families on the run from their lands for fear of their lives. We, too, have too many innocents being slaughtered, whether by violence or treatable disease or preventable starvation. We, too, seem to have a plethora of leaders terrified by the prospect of losing power and willing to do almost anything to hang on to it. We, too, see all kinds of well-intentioned people manipulated by individuals, corporations, and governments via social media and, and countless other ways to view the world in a distorted, corrupted way. We, too, see some who will become wise to the machinations of others stand firm in their resistance. So while this might not be the Christmas story we prefer, it does feel like a more realistic account of events. But before succumbing once again to that temptation of allegory that slams our opponents and validates our own convictions, let's note that this isn't intrigue and machinations and plots and violence in general, or even for the gain of power, political power, or wealth. But rather, all of this all of this wasted slaughter and wasted life is provoked by a promise, a promise of God, of a coming Messiah, and the salvation he will bring. What's so threatening about God's salvation, mercy, and grace? What's so threatening about a gift? Simply that it's a stark reminder that we need it, that we need that salvation, mercy, and grace and that we ourselves are not in control. That we, no more than Herod and all of Jerusalem, do not have the final say in how the world or even our lives will be run. So much will happen to us that we do not have control over. And this causes us great fear and anxiety. And while our technological capacity has advanced, our sense of humanity has not kept pace. We have not cultivated a world where wisdom prevails or hospitality is the priority. No, we've been given this illusion that we are in control, fueled by individual choice and that cult of autonomy. Each time we are presented with a more generous and life-giving approach, we oppose it. We say, no, thank you. We get defensive. Why? Because we're afraid. We fear losing our privileges and our freedoms. We fear being exposed to the reality that we need something. And that's what we witness in today's story. Jesus comes, and as we heard ancient Simeon say long before in the canticle, before he died, that he would be a sign to be opposed. So it was then, and so it is now. But let's also note what's constant across the centuries is not simply that Jesus occasions oppositions, but rather that he comes. Jesus comes. He comes in love and in mercy. That he comes to save. That he comes for all, leaving out no one who admits their own need. And let's note God's consistent action to side with the oppressed and save those who are in need. You see, God works through the Magi. God warns in dreams. God helps the family take flight, and God provides shelter and sanctuary in Egypt. Very little of this is what the various characters in the story would have hoped for or planned if they were in charge. And yet none of it, not even a little bit of it, is devoid of God's presence and God's planning. So it was then, and so it is now. And Jesus still comes. And sometimes Jesus even appears through us and our actions. That's the shocking thing of the Incarnation, is that God continues to work and be physically present in the world through us. We must not be surprised, of course, when we are opposed. Do not be surprised when our good deeds and our intentions are targeted and ridiculed and people try and thwart us left and right. This is what I experienced several weeks ago after St. Luke's hosted a feasibility conversation about refugee resettlement in Jamestown. You may have seen the story in the paper the following morning. I know that others sure did because we received phone calls from the general public that very morning expressing their 
displeasure, castigating us for engaging in this work, even though we had only just hosted the meeting at that point. And you can imagine how many will be opposed when they find out that we're taking the next steps forward to see about how we can be Christ in the world today by receiving those that are vulnerable and cast aside. After praying and discerning about this, I spoke to Mayor Sundquist about the, what the next steps might be. And we agreed that someone from the community needed to continue coordinating this work. And he looked at me meaningfully, and he smiled. And we both understood what he meant. And so given that this is our Christmas story, the question is, what will we do with it? Will we hold on to the dark elements, or will we let that hidden light of God beneath us shine forth? Will we work to provide hospitality despite the words hostility, or will we give up? This is the truth of the world, that we must look up despite the darkness, see the bright light that is leading us. We can't avoid the truth. We must go forward. We can't hide our heads under a bushel and not look up. It won't change the facts anyway. We cannot avoid the collision course that we are all on. We must face the reality. We need God's intervention. And God may just be sending us as the intervention. The world is difficult. That many entrusted with power are not trustworthy. That many who are well-intentioned will fall prey to manipulation. That far, far too many children are threatened and sacrificed to violence. That is the reality of the world. But there's another reality, that God is still at work, at work for the sake of the vulnerable, at work on behalf of those fleeing violence, at work for the sake of the world. And not only in mysterious and intangible ways through distant stars, but through us and the bright li light of our lives. Yes, God is fashioning the people in these pews to do God's work in the world, to take stands against leaders who manipulate through fear, to offer shelter and sanctuary to those needing it, to advocate for those who need to flee their homes, who resist oppression, violence, and manipulation. The good news of the gospel is that God is at work in fashioning us to be bearers of the light that has come into the world. A light the darkness neither understands nor can overcome. God is at work fashioning us to be an epiphany people, a people of the light, a people who know the joy and grace of Christmas is not a gift to be admired one time a year, but one to be put to work for the sake of the world that God loves so much. So look up, look around you, and see the hope that God is working through you and through those around you. Through this epiphany people, may God's light be seen. Amen.